Tammy Lynn Liefert was not the kind of girl to go unnoticed, even if she'd wanted to. She had the good looks and poise of a winning beauty queen, she was a popular sought-after model, and she was embarking on a career in movies by age 15. According to her talent agent mom, Linda Curtis, Tammy Lynn was always smiling. She awoke each morning with a joyful spirit, and she went to bed smiling as well. That is until Tammy Lynn returned from a weekend party out of town in the spring of 1983. She had just turned 18. From that day forward, Tammy Lynn was never the same, right up until the day she disappeared without a trace on July 6th. Tammy Lynn Liepert was born in Rockledge, Florida on February 5th, 1965 to Richard Liepert and Linda Curtis. An exceptionally beautiful child, Tammy Lynn began competing in pageants at age four. She nearly always took the crown. Tammy Lynn's parents divorced when she was seven years old, and Linda became her primary caretaker and manager. By the time the pageant princess was 16, she had amassed a collection of 280 tiaras out of 300 beauty competitions. She was striking, polished, and mature, and her mother's professional guidance helped Tammy to forge a modeling career. She was consistently booked, appearing in ads and magazine covers, including CoverGirl in 1978. It was clear she was destined for stardom. Tammy's lifelong dream was to become a professional actress. Hollywood opened its doors to her in 1980. She appeared in an uncredited role in the coming-of-age film Little Darlings, starring Tatum O'Neill, Christy McNichol, and Matt Dillon. She scored another small part in 1983's Spring Break. In addition to her role as boxing contest girl, Tammy Lynn's bikini-clad torso, hips, and legs were used in the movie poster. It was while working on this popular comedy in 1982 that she met an actor named Paul Land. His name will become important in a bit. Following the wrap of filming on spring break, Tammy Lynn attended a party out of town. When she returned, she was a completely different person, according to her mom and family friend, Wing Flanagan. Wing was one of Linda's clients, and he moved in with the Liepert family at age 11. He was like a little brother to Tammy Lynn. Following the weekend party, about which little has been written, the normally bubbly starlet became edgy and paranoid. She isolated herself in her room, refusing to go out or answer the phone. Finally, when pressed, she admitted to her mother that she had seen something she shouldn't have. She added mysteriously that someone might be trying to kill her. Despite Wing's prodding and Linda's concerned pleas for details, that was all she would divulge at the time. Two weeks later, Tammy Lynn had scored her biggest movie to date, a small but memorable role as the girl in the blue bikini in the Al Pacino smash Scarface. Filming was in Miami. Tammy Lynn made her mark early in the filming in scenes with actor Stephen Bauer. Then on day four, her world changed. The young actress, upon watching a bloody shootout scene, had a breakdown on the set. She was sobbing uncontrollably and was escorted to a trailer to recover. The casting director contacted Walter Leibowitz, Tammy's temporary guardian while in Miami, and asked that he come to the Scarface set. He found Tammy Lynn in the trailer, hysterical and incoherent. She was pacing and crying, saying someone was going to blow her head off. She mentioned money laundering and being desperate to hide. She wouldn't say who was out to get her, but she was in full-on panic mode. Leibowitz called Tammy's mom and suggested she get a psychological evaluation for her daughter right away. He also prompted her to visit the police to determine whether Tammy Lynn's fears were founded. With her scenes in the bag, Tammy Lynn quit the film and returned to her family home in Cocoa Beach. When she spoke to the local sheriff, Tammy called upon her burgeoning acting skills to pull off a sense of calm. She did not express any concerns for her safety and never mentioned that her life was in danger. Note, later interviews with Linda state that Tammy Lynn did reveal information regarding a Brevard County operation involving drugs, money laundering, and high-profile operatives. However, investigators deny that such a report was filed and state there is no merit to any of these purported claims of illegal activities. Upon returning home, Tammy Lynn's paranoia was in full force. She refused to eat or drink anything without having Wing taste test it first. She was convinced she was being poisoned. She called him to the window one evening, certain that the neighbor's new windowless van was being used to spy on her. 
Then on July 1st, 1983, Tammy Lynn became completely unhinged. After two weeks of self-imposed isolation, she stepped outside to get some sun and fresh air. The door locked behind her. Tammy completely panicked, banging on the door. Finally, she shattered the picture window with a baseball bat and accused Wing of deliberately locking her out. His indignant protests were in vain. She was in a frenzy, pushing the young teen and threatening him with the bat. He said she had a crazy look in her eyes and didn't seem to know who he was. Only Linda's intervention broke Tammy Lynn from this violent state. She described her as having a wild look. She feared for her daughter and admitted her to the Brevard County Mental Health Center for a complete physical and psychiatric workup. No alcohol or drugs were found in her system and Tammy was released after 72 hours. Upon returning home, she begged her mother to make a solemn promise. She asked that if anything should happen to her, Linda needed to get even for her. She was wholly convinced that danger was imminent and insisted, quote, he's still going to kill me. Linda pressed for more, but got nothing. She promised her daughter to get justice if such an unlikely event presented itself and did her best to comfort her. The day after Tammy's release from the hospital, she spent the afternoon with her best friend, Rick Adams. When he dropped her off at her house, she said she might be going away for a while and reminded him that she loved him. Rick returned the sentiment, but he had no idea this would be the last time he would see his friend. On July 6, 1983, Tammy was in good spirits. Linda and Wing noted that she seemed to be returning to her normal self. Linda did note, though, that Tammy Lynn didn't brush her hair that morning. This was unusual for the model so meticulous about her appearance. She presented as relaxed that morning and said she was headed to the beach with 20-year-old friend Keith Roberts. She was reportedly barefoot when she strolled down the sidewalk to his dark sports car. She was last seen wearing a blue denim skirt and a light blue shirt with flower appliques on the shoulders. Most reports confirm that she wore no shoes and carried no purse. Other sightings mention flip-flops and a small gray handbag. According to Detective Jim Scragg of the Cocoa Beach Police Department, around 3 p.m., Tammy and her male friend got into an argument, and she demanded to be let out of the car at the Glass Bank building. The bank was approximately five miles from her home. The pair never made it to the beach, and as we have learned, there were no later sightings of Tammy Lynn. I have read, however, that Tammy made three frantic calls to her aunt, Ginger Kolsch, from a nearby Exxon gas station that same afternoon. This is unconfirmed. Friends of Tammy's suggested to officials that she may have run away, but her mother dismissed that notion as totally unlikely. I'd have to agree. Though fearful and desperate, she certainly did not appear to have the means or the wherewithal to disappear on her own. With no money, identification, or even shoes, she was barely 18 years old. Her mother stated that she was scheduled to go to California for three months, nearly 3,000 miles from her Florida home, but the reason for her trip was not disclosed. Up until Linda's death from a blood clot infection in 1995, she believed her daughter was likely a victim of foul play by Florida locals involved in a drug trafficking and money laundering operation. But she always held on to the hope that Tammy Lynn may be alive with no idea who she is. I have included an age-enhanced photo herein, one of several age renderings completed over the last 38 years. It was Linda's dying wish that she learn what happened to Tammy. Many rumors swirled around the suspicious disappearance of the sunny girl who always stood out. Some suggested she may have been displaying signs of schizophrenia or a dissociative disorder before she disappeared. This has not been confirmed, but her erratic behavior in the preceding months indicates that some mental health challenges were present. Others suggest that actor Paul Land, with whom Tammy Lynn worked on spring break, may have killed her. Witnesses have stated that Land supplemented his modest acting career by dealing drugs on set. Some have also stated that Land boasted of a one-night stand with the teen actress. Some say she may have gotten pregnant. All of this is hearsay, as Land passed away in 2007 at the age of 51 and is therefore unable to answer to the allegations. I should also note that he still has supporters who vehemently defend him to this day. Some rumors, however, do sound like they may rest in the realm of possibility. Infamous serial killer Christopher Wilder was suspected of the murder of eight women and the rape of 12 during the early 1980s. 
His modus operandi was to lure pretty girls with promises of modeling contracts. Linda reported to investigators that she had seen Wilder in her talent agency on several occasions. She filed a $1 million lawsuit against Wilder, but later dropped it. The serial killer died in a shootout with police in 1984, and any connection to Tammy Lynn could never be proved or disproved. John Brennan Crutchley, known as the Vampire Rapist, moved to Brevard County two months before Tammy Lynn disappeared and is suspected of murdering 30 women. Many have tried to tie him to the Leapert case. Crutchley took his life in prison in 2002. True crime enthusiasts continue to study this perplexing case, adding additional theories to the story. Some say Tammy was overwhelmed by the responsibilities of financially supporting her family, so she ran away to start a new life. This seems contrary to the actions of an obviously ambitious young woman on the brink of stardom. Others say she got into a car with a stranger who killed her and dumped her body or fed it to alligators. This seems highly unlikely to me given her paranoid mental state in the weeks before she went missing. She didn't trust her own family to not poison her food. I doubt that she would hitchhike or willingly climb into a stranger's car. And finally, sex slavery comes up pretty regularly among cyber sleuths fascinated by this case. This one is quite disturbing to me and again, there are no leads to bear out this heinous possibility. As for Keith Roberts, he was questioned but never charged in Tammy's disappearance. I suppose they had no evidence against him, but it also doesn't appear that they looked very hard at the last confirmed person to have seen Tammy alive. Recent updates on Roberts reveal a 2017 arrest for drug possession and resisting arrest. While not confirmed, there have also been allegations of domestic abuse by Roberts against his ex-wife, whom he married in 1985 and she reportedly has claimed he frequently threatened, quote, you'll wind up like Tammy. It should be noted that I have not personally contacted his ex and feel no need to pull her into the story. Like so many other details in this case, it could simply be rumor. A glance at Robert's 2017 mugshot suggests he's had a rough 38 years since his last ride with Tammy. From my research, it sounds as if he more or less kicked her out of his car in the heat of their argument, as opposed to her demanding that he stop at Glass Bank. I am inclined to believe he angrily drove off and left her without looking back. But since she has never been declared dead and her cold case to my knowledge is still open, what harm would there be in another look at this person of interest? I was surprised to learn that several investigators believe Tammy Lynn is alive and well today. Cocoa Beach detective Harold Lewisham received two phone calls from a woman claiming Tammy was alive and well and enrolled in nursing school. I have read nothing about whether efforts were made to find Tammy Lynn attending a college, but the detective believes Tammy chose to run away. He suspects no foul play. Cocoa Beach detective David Bartman backs him up. He does not believe Tammy was abducted or taken against her will. Though most who obsess about Tammy Lynn's disappearance are good intentioned, the wild rumors posted to social media in many cases cause emotional pain and grief for Tammy's remaining family. Her sister Suzanne has used her Facebook page to keep Tammy's case alive and has worked in cooperation with the Cocoa Beach Police Department and Florida Department of Law Enforcement to develop new leads. I hope detectives Lewisham and Bartman are right. The Tammy Lynn Liebert is living under an assumed identity and working as a nurse in her mid-50s. I find it more likely that she did witness something traumatic and that in a vulnerable, confused state, she trusted the wrong person and met with foul play. I would be delighted to be wrong. I will post contact information below in the description box. For the record, Tammy spelled her name a number of different ways during her pageant and modeling days. I chose to spell it the way her sister Suzanne does on her Facebook page. If you are interested in true crime, I hope you'll subscribe to my channel. I cover six to eight cases each month. This month I traversed into missing persons and cold cases with Unsolved October. I will likely incorporate more unsolved cases into the mix. So if this interests you, please hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you'll get a reminder of each new compelling upload. Thanks for watching. Gary Clary out.